do all your chord progressions sound bad, like they aren't going anywhere, or that they could feature in any song. A chord progression is like a journey, with each chord representing a different destination. If you've been to each destination several times already, then you're going to have a long, boring journey. So in this video, I'm going to reveal three ways to transform your chord progressions, which will take you on a memorable journey. I'll also show you how they're easy enough for any beginner to try out, and how they can be used in full songs. Let's start with a question. Do you think interesting sounding progressions need complicated chords in them? Whenever I used to try and spice up a song I was writing, I'd reach for my guitar chord dictionary, pick the most exotic looking chord I could find, and crowbar it into the progression. The problem was that these chords stuck out like a sore thumb, and were often so difficult to play that I couldn't perform the song properly with them included. The truth, which took me far too long to discover, is that in most cases you don't need anything more than some basic three note chords to write great songs. Did you know that each of these basic major and minor chords has two additional variations that you can use straight away? I'll show you them now. In a major key there are three major chords that are available to you. For example, in the key of G major, these are 1, G major, 4, C major, and 5, D major. What if I told you we can expand our set of three major chords to nine without using any new or complex chord types? This is where major chord inversions come in. We created our chords with three notes each from the major scale. The first note in each chord is what gives the chord its letter. The other notes in the major chord are the third and fifth. For example, G major had the notes G, B and D. Its first note is G. This is also called the root note or bass note. It is played as the lowest note in the chord and may be played by the bass player in a band to signify the chord. If you change which of the three notes in the chord are played at the lowest pitch, then you create a chord inversion. If we play the third note of the major chord as the lowest note, then we create a first inversion chord. So if we play the B note as the lowest note in our G major chord, then we create a G major first inversion chord. The order of the other two notes above this do not matter. It's the lowest note that counts. Playing the fifth note of the major chord as the lowest note creates a second inversion chord. Therefore, playing the D note as the lowest note in the G major chord creates a G major second inversion. Again, the order of the other two notes above this do not matter. You may see inverted chords written a few different ways in notation. One way is where a small i is written before the chord's Roman numeral. This is for a first inversion. The second inversion uses two small i's. Another way is by using a small 6 or a 6 and 4 after the Roman numeral. The 6 is a first inversion and the 6 and 4 is a second inversion. Finally, you may see a slash used. The the letter before the slash is the chord and the letter after the slash is the bass note being played. Inversions are useful because they bring a different character to the major chords. Placing the emphasis on a different bass note allows them to be used in many ways by a songwriter. First inversions have a sense of movement, propelling a progression forward compared to the root chord. Placing the third note in the bass makes the chord want to rise or fall to the next chord, making it useful in descending or ascending progressions. Here's an example of using the first inversion. Listen to the difference it brings compared to the standard root chord. Second inversions are not as assertive as a root chord, but also not as mobile as the first inversion. They work well in intros and bridges to bring a different, less confident sound. Listen to them at work in this example.
The second inversion one chord is often used to delay and then lead to the five chord because they share the same bass note. For example, Want more major keys to try out? Seven easy songwriting keys are available to make your chord progression writing a breeze. Don't waste any more time searching. Go to majorkeychords.com now and download your free guide today. Link is also in the description. In a previous video, I made three versions of a song using only the major one, four and five chords in the key of G major. There will be a link to a playlist with that video at the end of this one, so stay tuned for that. Let's use some chord inversions to make the next revision to our song. We'll discuss the changes after having a listen to it. Pay particular attention to the inversions. We use the second inversion 5 chord for 3 bars of the intro to increase the impact of the 5 chord in bar 4. It also adds some variation rather than 4 bars of the same sound. The first inversion 1 chord in the verse breaks up 2 bars of the 1 chord and also steps us up to the 4 chord, creating some movement. In the second half of the verse we use inversions to break up the repeated 4 and 5 chords. They also create a rising bass line which lasts four bars and leads us up to the one chord at the start of the chorus. This adds a strong feeling of anticipation for the chorus to come. We use a second inversion five chord at the end of the chorus to act as a step down to the one chord as the chorus repeats. In the bridge we create a descending bass line using inversions on the four and five chords. At the end of the bridge we use the second inversion one chord to delay the five chord. I hope you can see from the song example how useful inversions can be for breaking up a song, creating new interest and movement and withholding certain chords for key moments in the song. It's easy to forget that we are still only using three major chords. In major keys there are three minor chords available to you. For example in the key of G major these are 2 A minor, 3 B minor and 6 E minor. Minor chords can play an important role in turnarounds. A turnaround is a chord progression, usually two or four bars, that loops several times or turns around. Their repetition is important in making song parts memorable. For this reason, they are often used in choruses. If you look at the chorus of the song we've created so far, you will see that it is a turnaround. Turnarounds are found everywhere in popular music. We'll discuss them further later on, but just be aware of them for now. Like the major chords, minor chords also have two inversions each. The process is the same as with the major chords. For example, the two chord A minor in the key of G major has the notes A, C and E. If we put the flat or minor third note in the bass, our lowest note becomes C. This is an A minor first inversion. As before, the order of notes above this do not matter. And if we put the fifth note in the bass, it is a minor second inversion. So for A minor, this would be the E note. The minor first inversion is a bit like the major first inversion. It can add a bit of movement to a progression. It also intensifies the minor sound because the flat or minor third note is now more prominent. The second inversion minor is gloomy and foreboding. Like its major second inversion cousin, it doesn't feel like it wants to move as strongly as the root or first inversion chords. 
As with our major chord inversions, minor inversions are useful for adding interest, displacing or delaying other chords and creating moving bass lines. Here's a progression that uses the three chord and both of its inversions. Listen to how the first inversion creates a rising bass line in bar 10, taking us to the one chord in bar 13. Also listen to the gloomy second inversion at the last bar. This would set us up for a repeat of the section or start another section with chord one. Any of the turnaround chords can be inverted. This can strengthen escalator effects, create interest or difference with later repeats and withhold chords for impact. Feel free to experiment and transform your own turnarounds to see which ones work in your own song. Keep in mind that if an inversion bass note matches another chord's bass note in the turnaround, it will weaken the sense of four different chords. Here's a turnaround with three first inversions, creating a strong escalator to the standard one chord. You can also set up future chord progressions with inversions and turnarounds. If you change the bass note with inversions to imply a future chord progression, it can act as a preview of what's to come. For example, an intro could be setting up a standard chorus turnaround It is worth noting that turnarounds should not be overused. They can make your songwriting boring, cliche and musically lazy. Increasing the number of turnarounds in a song weakens their impact. It also makes your song sound more like many other popular songs because turnarounds are so widely used. Also keep an eye on how many escalator type turnarounds are in your song. Try to keep this to only one and use some of the techniques discussed to make any other turnarounds really unique and different. In previous videos, I made four versions of a song using only the major 1, 4 and 5 chords in the key of G major. There will be a link to a playlist with those videos at the end of this one, so stay tuned for that. Let's use some of the minor chord techniques we've discussed to update our song. We'll have a listen and then discuss what's changed.
You can see that we have brought in the three minor chord. The intro uses inversions and standard chords to act as a trailer for the chorus bass line. The inversions mask the full chords for later in the song and the chord rate change in bar 4 moves us into the verse. We are also holding back our 3 minor chord for later in the song. In the verse we have added some movements by increasing the rate of chord change and using some inversions. Look at the 3 chord in the second half of the verse. It is the relative minor of the 5 chord that previously appeared there. It is also the first time we hear the 3 chord. We're using the first inversion so the bass note is the same as the 5 chord and it can still work in our rising bass line that sets up the chorus. It also shares a bar with its relative major chord 5. Our chorus has become a simple primary turnaround, which is in Roman numeral order. It is the only turnaround and the lack of inversion gives it a clarity compared to the rest of the song. The first half of the bridge is unchanged to keep the descending feel. In in the second half we introduce half bar 3 to 1 changes to inject some movement. We use inversions so that the chords share bass notes. The options we have to construct a major key song are now wide and varied. It can become overwhelming sometimes as a songwriter starting with a blank page and having so many options. Start with some chords you can play on your instrument or that you like the sound of and go from there. Think about creating a core or scaffolding for your song and then you can use some of the techniques we've discussed to flesh out or improve your song. We had a total of six chords to use in our major key song. So far we've only used four, but you can of course use five or even all six. If we do this, it further opens up the possibilities with our song. With inversions, that's 18 different chords to play with. Let's revise our song again to use utilize all six chords in the key of G major. We're going to use a full song arrangement this time, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Listen out for the final chorus after the bridge where we use some reharmonizing ideas. We'll discuss all the changes we have made after the song. In the intro we swap the 4 chord for its relative minor of 2. It is the only minor chord in this section. The verse stays the same, just previewing the 3 chord slightly. In the chorus we're changing the second repeat 1 chord to its relative minor 6. Listen to the drama this brings to the chorus. In the 4th bar of the bridge we're swapping out the 4 chord for the 6 minor chord. This shares the bass note with the inversion in the bar before. The rest of the bridge is the same. For our final chorus we have swapped out the chords for their relative minor or major in the first half. The second half is the standard chorus progression and we end 
end on the one chord this time to bring the song to a close. I was once trying to write a song and playing the chords in the key of G major, frustrated that they didn't sound good or interesting. As many guitar players have done, I started playing around with bar chords, linking the chords in the key with other chords to quickly generate progressions. This helped me to find some sounds that appealed more to me, but I didn't know what these chords really were. I now know that they all belong together in a group. I'll explain them to you now, starting with one of the most puzzling chords. In a major key there are seven chords. Three are major and three are minor. This leaves you with one chord, seven. The seven chord is a special case. It is diminished. But what is a diminished chord? A diminished chord is neither major or minor. It has a harsh, discordant sound which is difficult to sing over. For these reasons, and others, it is rarely used in popular music. So what can you do to use the seven chord? There's no rule saying do not use these chords, so I would suggest trying them out in your major key progressions to see what you think of them. In order to make the 7 chord more palatable and useful in major key chord progressions, there is a simple technique that is widely used. Take the root note of the 7 chord, drop it by half a step or semitone, and construct a major chord with this new note as the root note or first note. This major chord is often labelled as flat 7. Let's use an example to clarify this. In the key of G major, the 7 chord is F sharp diminished. The root note of this chord is F sharp. Drop this by half a step or semitone, and you have the F note. If you use this note as the root note of a major chord, you create a F major chord. So the flat 7 chord in the key of G major is F major. You can also think of the flat 7 chord as being borrowed from parallel keys. A parallel key is any which has the same root or tonic note. For example, we're using G major, so parallel keys would include G Dorian, G Mixolydian, G Phrygian, etc. The flat 7 chord is borrowed from the parallel Dorian, Mixolydian or minor keys. Another term that applies here is modal mixture or modal interchange. If this seems a bit confusing or advanced for you, then don't panic. Just follow the simple procedure earlier to construct your flat 7 chord. Now you may be thinking, how can I use the flat 7 chord? Unlike the 7 chord, the flat 7 is used widely in popular music across different genres. It can help bring unexpected toughness to a progression and allow you to get more mileage from your songwriting. It has a particular association with the blues, so for the first example, I will use it in a 12 bar blues progression. Because it is a borrowed chord and uses notes from outside of the major scale, the flat 7 can't be treated exactly like one of the other chords in a key. In order to avoid harmonic confusion, unless this is what you want, it is best to approach the flat 7 chord from the 1, 2, 4 and 6 chords. For example, You can use major and minor chord inversions to help you to create interesting bass lines. The flat 7 chord gives you an additional option when thinking about bass lines. For example, here is a rising bass line using flat 7. Using the inversions of the flat 7 chord can open up chord replacement opportunities. The first inversion has the same bass note as the 2 chord, so it could be used to replace it. The second inversion has the same bass note as the 4 chord, so it could be used to replace that. This means you can recycle progressions with these chords and swap out a chord for the relevant flat 7 inversion. This could be used in later repeats of a progression to generate new interest. For example, a standard 1, 6, 4, 5 progression could become 1, 6, Second inversion flat 7, 5.
When you create progressions using flat 7, you can sometimes run into issues. Look at this turnaround in the key of G major, and now this turnaround in the key of C major. Do you see the problem here? They are exactly the same chords, but from different keys. This may lead a songwriter to become confused as to what key they are in. Later progressions could sound correct, but the songwriter could mistakenly think they are in the other key. This ambiguity can be used to play with listeners' expectations if used correctly. But if you want to avoid it, then make sure you combine the use of several chords in a key with repetition to anchor the listeners' expectations into a certain key. Want more major keys to try out? Seven easy songwriting keys are available to make your chord progression writing a breeze. Don't waste any more time searching. Go to majorkeychords.com now and download your free guide today. Link is also in the description. You can also take the same approach you saw with the seven chords with two of the minor chords in the major key, three and six. This gives you the flat three and flat six chords. The quick way to find these in your chosen major key is exactly the same as the flat seven chord. You take the relevant minor chord, drop its root note by half a step or semitone, and use this to create a major chord. For example, in the key of G major, three is B minor, therefore flat three is B flat major. Six is E minor, therefore flat six is E flat major. As these chords are outside of the key, they are also borrowed chords like flat seven. In in this case, the flat 3 can be borrowed from the parallel Dorian, Phrygian and minor keys. The flat 6 can be borrowed from the parallel Phrygian, minor and Locrian keys. You may also see these chords referred to as chromatic medians, so there are several ways to refer to the same thing, as is often the case in music theory. The main usage of these borrowed chords is to change the sound of a major key song. They can create a sense of the unexpected and add spice to a chord progression. They could also be described as dark, funky or powerful. This muscle and drama means that they are often found in blues, R&B and hard rock songs. They allow a songwriter to use six major chords in the key. This lends itself well to distorted guitars, which can struggle with minor and open chords. They can toughen up a sequence, especially when replacing the minor three and six chords. They can be used in turnarounds and make powerful contributions to the intro or bridge, or contrast a verse with a chorus. The main point is that if you like the sound of these chords, then use them in your progressions. You can of course experiment with these flat chords in any way that sound good to you, but if you want a few pointers to begin with, I'll show you them now. Please note that the examples will be in the key of G major. When using the flat three chord, consider moving to the four chord. For example, Moving to the flat 6 chord. Moving to the flat 7 chord. When using the flat 6 chord, consider moving to the 5 chord. Moving to the 1 chord. Moving to the flat 7 chord. As with any triad, you have two inversions available when using the flat degree chords. These inversions can be used as substitutions in your progressions, maybe generating some interest in a later repeat of a song section. For the flat three chord, the first inversion has the same bass note or root note as the five chord, and the second inversion has the same bass note as the flat seven chord. For the flat six chord, 
The first inversion has the same bass note as the 1 chord, and the second inversion has the same bass note as the flat 3 chord. For example, a progression of 1, 1, 5, 4 could become first inversion flat 6, 1, first inversion flat 3, 4. When using the flat 3 and flat 6 chords to reharmonize or change later repeats, be careful with your melody notes. These two chords only have one note each from the relevant major scale. The melody notes you have used earlier in the song may sound very discordant and out of place when these lowered degree chords play underneath. However, this could also be just what you are looking for. As with all songwriting, experiment and trust your ear as to what sounds good and what sounds bad. There is also another set of useful borrowed or chromatic chords that you can use in your major key chord progressions. I'll take you back to basics to explain their function. You know that in a major key there are seven chords. These chords are created with three notes each and are known as triads. The notes for each of these chords comes from the relevant scale. For example, here are the seven chords in the key of G major, 1 G major, 2 A minor, 3 B minor, 4 C major, 5 D major, 6 E minor and 7 F sharp diminished. They are created with notes from the G major scale as shown. You'll see that they are labelled with Roman numerals. Generally speaking, you label major chords with uppercase Roman numerals and minor chords with lowercase Roman numerals. The Roman numerals indicate the role of each chord in the key. This is important when crafting chord progressions. The chord functions in a key can also be shown by using the following terms. These refer to the scale degrees on which the triads are built. Tonic, supertonic, mediant, subdominant, dominant, submediant, and leading. When it comes to major key chord progressions, the most important chords are 1, 4, and 5. This takes you through the different chord families that provide tension and resolution, which is fundamental to Western music. The tonic chord is stable and feels like home. The subdominant provides you with some movement and takes you on a journey. And finally, the dominant creates tension. This instability needs to be resolved, which is what happens when you move back to the tonic chord. It is common to use the five dominant chord at the end of progressions to resolve back to the one chord. Listen to this example in the key of G major and hear how the role of the chords change. You now know what the dominant chord is and its relationship to the tonic chord. This will allow you to understand the concept of secondary dominance. If you take one of the chords 2 to 7 and treat that as the new tonic chord, you can then work out a dominant chord for this new tonic. If you use this new dominant chord in your original key, it is known as the secondary dominant. I'll clarify this with an example. You saw the key of G major earlier. The dominant 5 chord in the key of G major is D major. I'll now treat this D major chord as the tonic. The D major chord is the tonic or one chord in the key of D major. So let's now look at the chords in the key of D major. You can see that the dominant five chord in the key of D major is A major. This is the secondary dominant of the five chord in the original key of G major. You may see this referred to as the dominant of the dominant or the five of five. It is written in notation with a capital V followed by a slash and another capital V. I'll use this secondary dominant in a chord progression. The most common way to do this is to play your secondary dominant before your target chord. In the next example, I'll play A major before D major. Listen to the strong pull to the D major chord and the resolution it provides, whilst also serving its purpose as the dominant for the tonic chord G major. This adds a layer of interest to the progression. Secondary dominant chords don't strictly belong in the key, 
as they introduce notes from outside of the scale, but they are widely used and the strength of resolution to the target chord means that they don't sound out of place. Using a secondary dominant is like performing a mini key change, with the target chord being the tonic of this new key. It's like a brief glimpse into another key, but because you don't dwell on the new tonal center, it is never established. It is very common to see dominant chords written with a 7 next to them. This indicates a dominant 7th chord. Dominant 7th chords further intensify the drawback to the one tonic chord and create what is known as a perfect cadence. Let's look at the previous example again, but this time I'll change the secondary dominant and dominant chords to dominant 7th chords. Listen to the difference this creates. You can use the secondary dominant of any chords in a major key, not just the 5 chord. The notation will reflect this, with an uppercase V followed by a slash and then the target chord Roman numeral, such as V slash 4, V slash 6, etc. The distance between the tonic note and the dominant is 7 half steps or semitones up. This is also known as a perfect fifth. Therefore, one way to work out your secondary dominant chord is to start on the root note of your target chord and count up seven half steps. Then you create a major chord with this new root note. For example, let's say you want to work out the secondary dominant of the sixth chord E minor in the key of G major. If you count up seven semitones from the root note E, you get to B. So the secondary dominant of the sixth chord E minor is B major. Using the five of six to six chord change is one of the most common uses of the secondary dominant in popular music. Let's use that in a chord progression, first without dominant 7th chords, and then with dominant 7ths. An interesting thing occurs if you work out the secondary dominant of the four chord. In the key of G major, the four chord is C major. Count up a perfect fifth from C and you get to G. This means that the five of four in the key of G major is G major. Obviously, this will just sound like the tonic chord. But if you change the chord to a dominant seventh, then it takes on its new role. That's because typically you would turn the one tonic chord into a major seventh chord. Listen to the difference between them in the following progression. So far I've always resolved the secondary dominance to their target chord straight away, but you can create longer chains of secondary dominance. The 5 of 2 is E major. I'll make that a dominant 7th chord and use it to begin the progression. Typically you would resolve this to the 2 chord which is A minor, but if you use the secondary dominant that is on the same root note, you can continue the chain. In this case, the 5 of 5 is A major, so after the E dominant 7th chord, or play A dominant 7th. You can keep this sort of chain going as long as you like, but in this example I will resolve the 5 of 5 to the 5 D dominant 7th chord and then the tonic G major. Listen to how the chain sounds. Another idea you can explore is to not resolve the secondary dominant at all. This creates an interesting sound because the listener is expecting resolution and when it is denied, a strange displacement is heard. Look at this example with the 5 of 6. You would typically play the 6 chord right after this, 
but instead I will completely ignore the 6th chord and carry on with the progression. Combined with not using any dominant 7th chords, listen to how this changes the feel of the progression. In the second half I'll also experiment with chord inversions to highlight the descending nature of this progression. Always remember that inversions are available to highlight certain notes and create different effects within your chord progression. In another video on the channel I created the chords for a major key song. That video is in the playlist that you will find at the end of this video. I'm going to use this song to demonstrate some of the borrowed chord ideas you've learnt in this video. I'll talk through some of my thoughts now and then you can have a listen to the completed song. In the intro I've changed bar 3. Previously this was just one bar of the 2 chord A minor. To add a bit of tension I've split this bar in two. The 2 chord now shares the bar with the first inversion flat 7 chord. They both share the A bass note, so the change between them isn't completely jarring. I wanted to add something that stood out in the verses. I liked the escalator in the second half that builds up to the chorus, so I left that unchanged. In the end, using the flat 6 chord as a brief passing chord between 4 and 5 adds both rhythmic interest and chromatic tension that separates it from the rest of the song. The choruses are supposed to have a clarity compared to the rest of the song, so I've only made a minimal change here. I've split the final bar in two, introducing the 5 of 5 before the 5 chord. This heightens the tension and desire to resolve to the 1 chord after the chorus. Finally, I wanted to allow the bridge to further drift away from the song chorus. To do this, I introduced a 5 of 6 chord before the 6 chord. This provides more of a pull to the 6 chord. I also made it a second inversion, so its bass is F sharp. This matches the first inversion 5 chord from the previous bar. The idea here is to preserve a descending G F sharp E bass line. In the second half of the bridge I maintain a rising B C D bass line from the previous version, but this time play a second inversion flat 7 chord in the second bar instead of the 4 chord. This adds an air of mystery to the bridge which helps it maintain a unique character. Have a listen to the song and then have a go at using borrowed chords in your own chord progressions. The great songwriters know everything you have learned in this video, but they also know many more fundamental songwriting skills. Without these, you're never going to write a song. Change that right now by watching the playlist on screen.